Okay, so I'm supposed to be working on like four different videos and also a dissertation. So what better time to become completely consumed by an obsession with an irrelevant franchise? I put on Pirates of the Caribbean a couple weeks ago on a whim and that was the end of it for me. I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. Honestly, this is the first impulse that I have had to do any work in several weeks and you really do have to ride that high when it comes. So here we are. I have become a pirates expert and it is now time to report to you what I have learned about this franchise. The great, the mediocre, the corporate greed that looms over everything. It's all here, me mateys. I've got some rum for the occasion. Sailor Jerry's, never Captain Morgan. Screw that guy, he was a terrible pirate. Not a man of the code. I'm gonna sit here and talk about pirates until I either run out of rum or run out of things to say about pirates. I'm not a very good drinker, so it'll probably be the latter. Our story begins in Anaheim. Pirates of the Caribbean is a theme park ride in Disneyland that was built in the 60s. It was the last ride that Walt Disney himself helped design. Um, it is part of the New Orleans section of Disneyland and it is extremely cool. There's a lot of forced perspective going on in this ride that really does prey on your imagination. Like it begins with a fairly long boat ride through a gulf swamp and there are fireflies everywhere. Um, and it really does feel like you're there for certain parts of this ride, it's very strange. So Pirates has always been a popular ride and as it is the job of Disney to find ever more ways to wring money out of their properties, no shade, that's the reality of things. In the late 90s, Disney starts to think maybe there's an opportunity to be had with Pirates. Hmm, they think. Most of our other rides are attached to some kind of movie. Maybe we could do the opposite sort of thing and uh, like adapt some of the rides that aren't attached to anything. That way we can have multiple forms of media peddling the same thing and that could market our theme park. And at the same time, it could generate its own income. Handshakes all around, everybody wins, great. So in 2002, when Pirates of the Caribbean is still in pre-production, Disney releases the first of these theme park ride adaptations, The Country Bears. You all remember that smash hit, The Country Bears. I want to see me cry. Oh, I want to die. Yeah, everyone hated it. And the tale goes that when Disney CEO Michael Eisner saw what Johnny Depp was doing with the role of Jack Sparrow, he very nearly pulled the plug on the entire thing. They wanted someone a little more palatable for that role. I think Matthew McConaughey was actually at the top of the list at one point. <laughs> Can you imagine? So anyway, they had hired Gore Verbinski to direct. And at that point he had really only directed commercials a couple of small scale movies and everyone at Disney 1000% expected it to fail hard. What happened instead, obviously, is that Disney made four and a half billion dollars over a five film franchise that defined multiple people's careers and ushered in the dominion of Disney over all of pop culture that we all have to live through today. The first movie came out in 2003 and the last movie came out in 2017, by which time everybody was pretty well sick of it. But was that rejection of the sequels really justified? Are they as bad as public opinion would imply? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're pretty bad, <laughs> but not for the reasons you may think. So I'm gonna go over everything that I think is important to know about each of these movies, most of which will have nothing to do with the plot because honestly, the plot is the least interesting thing about Pirates of the Caribbean. Basically, all you need to know is that the plot formula these movies follow go pretty much unchanged over the course of the entire franchise. There's always a supernatural ship and crew. They're always at odds with or explicitly out to get Jack. There's always a stuffy British naval presence to remind you how much cooler it is to be pirates. And there's always some kind of magical maritime MacGuffin everyone is after for their own reasons. All right, let's fucking go. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me. Curse of the Black Pearl is a perfect movie. It deserves every shred of praise it gets, and almost every single good thing that happens in this entire franchise is lifted directly from this movie. Not every good thing, but damn near. Our bad guys, Captain Barbosa and company, who are cursed by our magical item, Aztec Gold. Commodore Norrington is our secondary antagonist. Now, the thing that is important to keep in mind for the character of Jack Sparrow and the narrative function of piracy in this movie is that his version of piracy is telling a folkloric myth, right? Jack is a trickster god. He's a Loki or an Anansi. He's, a, he's an apparently bumbling idiot who's actually a secret genius and whose morality is kind of up for debate. 
Barbosa is also figuratively a god. Their beef is with each other. As far as they're concerned, everybody else in this movie really could be anybody else. It does not matter. Their conflict has a long history before the movie ever starts and exists independently of other people's actions or desires. It's a very unusual and very legitimately interesting way to structure a story. You really don't see a trickster god archetype that often. This movie is considerably smaller than the other ones. It doesn't have nearly as much of a budget, uh, and that can honestly sometimes be a good thing. <laughs> the lack of a bigger budget can spur much better decision making with things like pacing, which the latter films really struggle with. Like there's actual tension in the scene where the Black Pearl is chasing down the Interceptor, which is really impressive considering that what is essentially happening here is one boat following another boat at like a jogging pace. <laughs> they think through this battle and it's good, it's cool. It, you know, realism is a spectrum, but it involves actual tactical battle decisions. Also, this is really the only ship battle that happens over the entire franchise, by which I mean, it's the only one that isn't either adulterated by some kind of supernaturality, like the Maelstrom in, in the third movie, or cut with a negotiation scene or otherwise truncated in some kind of way. Isn't that weird? One ship battle across like 25 hours of pirate content. Like I get that it might be morally complicated to have Jack attack a merchant ship or something, but like they could have done it with Blackbeard. I don't know, it just seems weird to me. Anyway, everybody is completely on their game in this movie. Johnny Depp is of course instantly iconic and Jeffrey Rush is like the platonic ideal of piracy. Kira Knightley is convincingly terrified without seeming weak of spirit. Orlando Bloom is frequently accused of being a really bland actor, but I actually think he's really funny in this movie. A lot of the humor is resting very squarely on his shoulders. He wrote to Carpel of Sea Turtles. I see turtles. What did he use for rope? Like he doesn't seem stupid, he just seems very earnest and square, which is cute. It's nice. It's a it's a good counterpoint to um, to how Jack behaves. They all get zingers, whether through acting or dialogue or both. And that's awesome. Will and Elizabeth's humor is situational. It's set up by the camera. They get sort of light humiliations that set them up as fish out of water. Ha ha, sea puns. Jack and Barbosa's humor is through dialogue. They are, again, the gods of this world. It is their decisions that determine the course of everybody else's fate, so we have to take them seriously, but they're also literal movie pirates, so serious is a word that gets to have a pretty broad interpretation. Pirates of the Caribbean is a deeply weird franchise, and all of its standards are set up by this movie. It is a straightforward pirate adventure comedy with horror elements. <laughs> And away we go. Do you feel death? Do you feel like the dark abyss? Dead man's chest. Our bad guy is Davy Jones and company. Our magical item is Davy Jones' heart locked in a chest. Our secondary antagonist and British presence is the East India Trading Company led by Cutler Beckett, the most punchable face in the franchise. It's just good business. Okay. So we're headed for a 20 year cycle with these movies. And as always happens, there has been something of a reassessment of the pirate sequels. Fine, great. Except one opinion I keep seeing is that the sequels are so underrated that they're actually better than the original. Take that critics. This is the freshest tomato that ever was. Dead Man's Chest is a much bigger movie. It's fancier. It has more money behind it. It's more inventive. It's ambitious. I get it. I, like I do, I get it. I get why you might think these movies are good. I respect everybody's right to hold an incorrect opinion, including my own. So feel free to tell me how wrong I am in the comments, but Dead Man's Chest is a mess. It's a mess. It's a beautiful mess, but it's a mess regardless. And all of its problems are symptomatic of the things that eventually ruins this franchise. It's like a new mole that you really should get checked out. There are a couple of unqualified great things in this one though. The first great thing that happens is that Jack gets a dedicated theme song and it absolutely slaps. I mention this because I'm about to talk a lot of shit about the sequels and I think it's important to point out where things go right. There's so much cynicism that went into the creation of this franchise and I think it's important to remember that, that that can be the case at the same time as there's a lot of love put into these movies. Like there's a reason that they were such a cultural mainstay for a few years. For all the people who were emphatically not doing their job with this franchise, there are a few people who emphatically were. 
Jack's theme song is a bigger, better version of a theme in the first movie, back when Disney thought it was gonna flop and didn't wanna give it any money. So that means that a lot of the things that were already cool about the first movie become really cool in the next ones. This is what I genuinely love about big blockbuster movies. They're basically the only place we get a lot of money and resources put into people making art. The larger production might not always be art, but its component pieces often are. I get more narrative satisfaction out of this song alone than I do most of the movies. This theme song aesthetically encapsulates everything great about the first movie and everything great about Jack Sparrow as a character and everything the following ones needed to be. Funny, unusual, exciting, beautiful, and simple. Boy, howdy, is there a lot of stuff in Dead Man's Chest. Like literal items. Some of it is unusual and beautiful, but most of it is just a series of objects to find. So many, so many objects to find. We need to find Jack. We need to find the compass that Jack has. We need to find the chest. We need to find the Flying Dutchman, find the key, find Will. And this movie does truly need all those plot points because without them, this movie is about nothing. We'll get to that later. But this results in some serious pacing issues. Like I like the ideas of the Cannibal Island sequence and, and the windmill sword fight and whatever, but they go on forever, you guys. There is a great jump scare on that island though. It's awesome and it works every time. Speaking of the Cannibal Island sequence, uh, I wanna take a minute before we move on and talk a little bit about setup and payoff. Many of my esteemed YouTube colleagues like to point at how the later movies pick up on throwaway lines in the first movie to formulate their plots. Let us take, for example. And then they made me their chief. Which is later folded into Dead Man's Chest as the Cannibal Island sequence. Singapore is another one. Clearly you've never been to Singapore. Now, I don't really have any issue with this kind of thing. It's perfectly fine. It's kind of cute, but that's not what setup and payoff means. <laughs> Reminding us that Singapore exists and that Jack once mentioned it says nothing about his character or anybody else's and does not further the plot in any way. Setup and payoff is almost never accomplished through dialogue alone. Setup and payoff is Elizabeth's corset, which we are told is uncomfortable, set up, and which discomfort results in her narrowly missing death and setting the entire movie in motion, payoff, as well as being a multifaceted metaphor about the repressiveness of the society she lives in, for women in particular, but for human beings overall. The latest fashion in high society London is literally suffocating her, but that's a far smaller crime than having it torn off so she can breathe. And this doesn't have to be completely plot related. Set up and payoff is Barbosa's apple, which is introduced in the monologue describing the curse, set up, and from then on becomes our visual illustration for what the curse specifically means to him, an inability to enjoy simple pleasures that are available to everybody else, pirate or no. The apple represents the frustration that motivates him and with which he eventually dies, payoff. The apple is such a potent character symbol that it's the subject of the last stage direction in the last frame of the last scene of Dead Man's Chest. Setup and payoff is important. It's not just a synonym for Easter eggs. Elizabeth gets to breathe, Barbosa gets to eat an apple, and both of those things mean something. Um, what else? The Elizabeth, Will, Jack love triangle is gross and I hate it. It makes a certain amount of sense for Jack to be into Elizabeth, but in the first movie, it's like a joke. Right? Like it's funny that Jack is delusional enough to think that he could actually close that deal. Like that's how it's written, that's how it's played, and it works. It works the way it is. What's happening here is that Elizabeth isn't our point of view character in this one, so she needs something to do. And since she's a lady, they gave her a love triangle to be reiterated in every other scene with some sort of noxious euphemism. You do know Will taught me how to handle a sword. But the second great thing that happens in this movie is Davy Jones and his crew. Gorgeous, 
gorgeous, so beautiful. So the idea behind Davy Jones is that he's supposed to be ferrying people who die at sea to the other side, but Davy Jones is anti-work, I guess. So since the Flying Dutchman has spent so much time in the land of the living instead of the land of the dead, like it's supposed to, all of the crew have started to be sort of colonized and shape-shifted into various sea critters. And it looks amazing. Like it really does. It holds up incredibly well. To this day, I will contend that the crew of the Flying Dutchman is the best CG monster artistry available on film. They are absolute crust core, but every one of them is distinctive. They're so grimy and overwrought, but in a way that makes them seem like scary and otherworldly instead of just messy. CG has a real problem with looking way too clean and this movie does not have that problem. Amazing, no notes. You know, for all that pirates are clever cogs, we are an unimaginative lot when it comes to naming things. Right. I once sailed with a geezer, lost both of his arms, part of his eye. What'd you call him? Larry. At World's End is a continuation of movie two, so our bad guys and our magical items are pretty much the same. Blessedly, we get a lot more of Davy Jones and his crusty, crusty crew, but cursedly, he's like an adjunct arm for Beckett and the East India Trading Company, which never really sat right with me. Like, Davy Jones is supposed to be of the sea. Like, he doesn't operate by the same rules as human enterprise. I don't know, there's room to disagree with me on this. I just think it's kind of lame and basic to have our stuffy British presence ordering around a literal sea god. We'll revisit this later. A lot of defenses of the second and third movie are what I like to call look at that arguments. Look at that. There's a scene in Purgatory where the Black Pearl is crewed by like 20 versions of Jack. Look at that, hmm? What about those crab guys? Davy Jones stands in a bucket. Look at that, huh? You don't see that every day. Some will refer to this as though abject weirdness amounts to good filmmaking. I Utterly mean, deceptive twaddle twa speak, says I. That is the lowest possible bar. Movies are not just good because they're weird, y'all. And I say this as a person who takes weirdness quite seriously. There's nothing special about decontextualized weirdness, okay? Nothing could be easier. Watch this, melting zebra. I just made a very specific image appear in your mind, didn't I? Incredible. And I didn't even need $300 million to do it. In fact, for my trouble, all I ask is that you give me $50 a month off Patreon. You're welcome. Anyway, there's stuff to like about this one too. It's visually very beautiful, but I do have some reservations about the plot. I co-signed the decision to bring back Barbosa as den mother until the gang retrieves Jack. That's fine. However, there is something of a tone issue here that kind of dovetails with another one of my huge problems with At World's End, which is Elizabeth's meteoric rise to literal pirate king. Made you, Captain? Just giving the bloody title away now. I know people are gonna come at me in the comments like, oh, she's only made king and captain by accident. You're nitpicking, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I get that. What I don't get is how Elizabeth, who is implied to be in no small amount of specifically sexual peril in the first movie, ends up as respected as she does as quickly as she does. To be clear, I don't have an issue with her being respected in this environment. I think we can allow that in a series that also features this shot. I'm just saying that Elizabeth's ability to acclimate to this world is an important character beat, and it sucks that we don't get to see her earn it. Like watching all of these movies one after the other, it is truly jarring to see Elizabeth and Barbosa being completely friendly and decent to each other when all previous interactions between them have been leery and terrorizing. Though it does seem a shame to lose something so fine, don't it, lads? So I'd be having that dress back before you get them. <laughs> By this point, Will and Elizabeth's romance is just tiresome. Nothing really solves their communication issues. Like, I'm glad they work it out, but it's not really motivated by anything except their impending death. Boo! This movie has lazy writing. Most of the humor in this one is Jack's, which also sucks. In the other movies, everybody got to be funny. The only real exception is the Brethren Court, which is the best scene of the movie. This is the kind of shameless lore that I am totally here for. As per the code, an act of war, and this be exactly that, can only be declared by the pirate king. You made that up. They're like the Greek pantheon, going back to our narrative gods angle. Suddenly Jack doesn't seem all that out of place surrounded by all these other very powerful but deeply narcissistic and childish people. I love that they all have names and obvious histories with each other. I love that pirate lordship is passed down through pieces of garbage. I love Keith Richards as Jack's father and keeper of the code, but mostly I just love the dynamic in this room. You really do get the feeling that each of the pirate lords would describe themselves as very important 
important and one of a kind, even though they're all basically the same person. I like that. I think it's really funny and it works. This is madness. This is politics. So at the end of this movie, things are pretty much wrapped up. Everybody gets a fair amount of closure and or dies. I will pick on Cutler Beckett's death scene though, before we move on. It gets a lot of love online, but I just think it's so silly. <laughs> it's such a masturbatory use of CG with him walking down these stairs and the music, it goes on forever. I just end up giggling at it every time, I'm sorry. On the off chance that this does not go well for me, I would like it noted here and now that I am fully prepared to believe in whatever I must, so that I may be welcomed into that place where all the goody goodies get to go, savvy? I hate this movie. I, ha I hate this movie more than is probably fair. It could definitely be worse, and there are still things to appreciate. Richard Griffiths as King George would be one of the series' highlights if it weren't so tonally out of step with the other movies. Like, now when I watch Governor Swan send his urgent letter to London in Dead Man's Chest, I can't not think about how he's earnestly hoping that this man will be the solution to his problems. Another thing I like is the idea of Barbosa going legit by becoming a privateer. This was a thing that actually happened where you could basically just go be a professional pirate for the king and like pinky promise to only attack the Spanish and French. That's what they're offering Jack in the second movie. That's what the letters of Mark are. So if you have the letters of Mark, you're still a pirate, but you have these papers that basically give you qualified immunity. So you can just roll up on someone else's ship and be like, oh, no, 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 this is official murder. So it's okay. I am going to need you to give me all your stuff, though. In my opinion, they don't do enough with that idea, given how ridiculous it is. But I do like that it's there. This also means that Barbosa fills our British authority requirement in this movie, which is an interesting variation. And our magical item is the Fountain of Youth. Movies four and five are much more episodic than the others, and without Will and Elizabeth to anchor things to reality, everything seems a little aimless, but I can forgive that. That's okay. My complaints come down to a very few specific things. Thing one is that our bad guy is Blackbeard, and they got Ian McShane to play him, and yet he's still the worst villain in the entire franchise. I don't know, that, that somehow seems just blasphemous to me. There's a bunch of voodoo stuff on his ship. I guess he's like the superstitious type. I like that, I, that's, that's cool, I can get behind that, but it truly goes nowhere. In the later movies, they really go out of their way to make sure you know where everybody gets every shred of information, uh, like up to and including inventing entire characters whose job it is to move the plot along. So it's incredibly dumb to me that Black Blackbeard's explanation for why he needs a fountain of youth is that one of his zombie crewmen is psychic. All that voodoo nonsense, and that's the best they could come up with. Thing two is that the mermaid design in this movie is derivative and boring. They try to do this thing where the water level is what determines the extent to which a mermaid is mermaidy, but it just comes across like they kept changing their minds in post from scene to scene. <laughs> They're not especially scary underwater, and they try to do this replacement Will and Elizabeth romance that does not work. Partly because there's already a romance that also sucks. Thing three, I don't like Penelope Cruz in this movie. I like Penelope Cruz in general, but she is poorly cast here. Everything she does is a spicy Latina stereotype with no irony whatsoever, which just doesn't read well next to Johnny Depp's performance, which is basically all irony and has been for the entire franchise. In this movie, she's Blackbeard's daughter and first maid of the Queen Anne's Revenge, which I believe even less than Elizabeth Swan Pirate King. It's just a retread of that tired old corporate feminism where women are only worthy of respect if they're doing man things. I hate it. Her motivations are unclear and dumb, and worst of all, her characterization actively works against the movie. She's such a liar that even when she's telling the truth, you're not willing to invest yourself into anything she says until it's too late and you realize you were supposed to take her at her word this time. On that note, there's an exchange I really hate in this movie that just says so much about the lack of care in the production of this movie as a whole. You lied to me by telling me the truth? Yes. That's very good. May I use that? You already did that. You've already done it. You did it in the first movie. There was a whole running joke about it. I said no lies. I think he's telling the truth. If he were telling the truth, he wouldn't have told us. Unless, of course, he knew you wouldn't believe the truth, even if he told it to you. Thing four, Gore Verbinski didn't want to make this movie, and instead of asking why, Disney just hired Rob Marshall to do it instead, and he did a bad job. The best movies are a collaborative process. There should be a more or less constant conversation between the director and the actors and the writers, and what appears to have happened 
in On Stranger Tides is that Rob Marshall decided to not do his job and instead rely on the momentum of the franchise and just the raw talent of everybody else. The commentary on this track is seriously one of the most depressing things I've ever heard. No discussion of theme or intent, no attention paid to the story as a whole, just diplomatic press circuit level appreciation of extras and how nice Hawaii is. They say nothing of substance, nothing. You see, what's happening in this part is that it's the beginning of the movie, and we, we really felt it was important to stress that this is actually how the plot starts. None of the other pirates had actually um, taken place in London, and so to have the story and the uh, opening sequence, this whole beginning taking place in London was a whole fresh new, new idea. This, uh, this action sequence begins here and goes on for quite some time, and it really is the opening action sequence of the piece. And we had a great time... Um, putting this together because we knew it was the opening sequence and we wanted it to really sort of jumpstart the movie. Well, you know, for now we get our guys 100%, we regroup, we get pucks deep, get pucks in the net, and uh, no one's mocking him. It's like Rob Marshall is a mildly approving bystander, which is a really weird vibe to get from the director of the movie. Thing five is that Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides is the most expensive movie ever made. Why? It's by a lot too. Even if you don't account for inflation, this movie outpaces Age of Ultron's budget very comfortably at $378 million in 2011 money. I legitimately can't figure this one out. What effects there are are not groundbreaking and are frequently practical. Like I'm sure the principal cast got paid a lot, but there's no ship battle across a giant whirlpool. There's no ghost crew created out of whole cloth. Where is all this money going? That's not a rhetorical question. I can't figure this out and it'll haunt me to the end of my days. Death. Death will come straight for him. Would you say that to him? Paul McCartney is in this movie. Guilty found. Uncle Jack! Jackie boy! I know the Jack Sparrow family cameos are a little divisive, but this is the kind of shit I love. I love that they all look and act like variations on a theme. I love the implication that piracy is like a family business for them. It's just one of those slightly surreal things that calls back that idea of Jack as a trickster god whose only purpose is to be a slight inconvenience for others. I think it's funny. And that's about the only glimmer of the old Jack Sparrow we get in what will almost certainly be the last real Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I would not say that he's at the top of his game in On Stranger Tides, but the character is at least still there. He, like, he's got some zingers. He still narrowly evades death in exciting and unexpected ways. This Jack seems tired. This Jack is starting to look a little puffy around the cheeks. Jack is drunk for most of this movie, and from what I understand, so was Johnny, <laughs> due to the uh, personal complications he had at the time. Our bad guy is Spanish ghost Captain Salazar. Our magical item is the Trident of Poseidon, which Will and Elizabeth's son Henry need to break Will's curse. There's also a Lost Daddy subplot that Guardians of the Galaxy did better in the same year, no less. That's a burn. Our British presence is some guy played by Faramir from Lord of the Rings. Nice to see him getting work. And they basically just exist to be killed by Salazar's ghost ship, which eats other ships. One nice thing is that we've rediscovered cinematography in this one. There are a couple cool things thoughtful shots. Salazar's ship is always appearing under a single thundercloud in the far distance, and that's a really cool image. The CG is pretty good. There's also some fun to be had in this one. I, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit that I lolled a couple times. Like there's this scene that involves everybody running after Jack down the beach because Jack has like a, a little bottle with the black pearl stuck inside. It's a long story. And so everybody is running after Jack as he tries to get the bottle to the, to the water in time because it's gonna explode at any moment. <laughs> <laughs> like a grow your own dinosaur. <laughs> Salazar is genuinely quite scary, but played funny, which is the absolute right approach. Javier Bardem is actually really good in this movie. Um, it's almost worth watching just for him. He elevates the role. <laughs> Do you hear that? This pirate wishes to be cordial. So let me show you what my cordiality is. Hombre, every time I tap my sword, one of your men will die. So I suggest you speak quickly. Might want to go a bit faster, Capitan. He and Jeffrey Rush are really the only ones who know what movie they're in. I'm not altogether certain that Johnny Depp knew where he was at all. And that's really unfortunate because this franchise really does swing on the hinge that Johnny Depp makes. And if he's not having fun, nobody gets to have fun. And that really is the feeling that you get coming out of this one. It's kind of like 
you know, if you, you sit down and eat a pie and it's pretty good, and then you get to the last bite and there's a hair in it. You get wistful for the days of your millennial yore when a Pirates movie was something to look forward to. So I guess after seeing all of these movies in a row, the main feeling I'm left with is a pretty severe lack of balance. If you can imagine a barbecue dinner, you know what to expect, right? You've got your ribs, you've got your fries, you've got your collard greens, you've got your corn on the cob. And so let's say uh, your dinner arrives, you open the box and it's like one rib, seven fries, an appropriate amount of collard greens and like 20 corn cobs. I'm really hungry. I'm gonna go get some food one second. That took forever. All I wanted on God's green earth was a sandwich, but apparently 5 p.m. is too late for anybody to make me a sandwich within walking distance. Oh, I guess I could just get in that kitchen, make my own, am I right, lads? Where was I? Uh, barbecue, right, barbecue. Pirates of the Caribbean is like bad barbecue. Not enough main courses, too many sides. There is very little cohesion of either plot or atmosphere from one movie to the next. Uh, and even though the individual scenes are generally pretty good, as a whole, everything just kind of falls apart, especially now that we're in the you know age of peak synergy between all intellectual properties. There are a couple things though that are uniformly good. So here are some just sort of miscellaneous notes, things that I noticed. One nice thing is that the ships in all these movies are their own characters. And that's really cool. I like that a lot. Well, Black Pearl is different from the Interceptor, which is different from the Dauntless, which is different from the Flying Dutchman. I'm kind of attached to the Black Pearl now, you know? One thing I noticed in this most recent rewatch of Curse of the Black Pearl is that the Black Pearl- Hey, hey! One thing I noticed in this most recent rewatch of the first movie is that the Black Pearl brings its own spooky fog bank along with it wherever it goes, which I think is kind of adorable. The heathen gods had a sense of humor. Another thing is language. Pirates of the Caribbean is so much fun to listen to. They really do take advantage of that 18th century hyper formality of the English language. The words people are using are so delicious. Paradon, you'll see no mercy from me. Say what robs you of your staunch heart gives or forever leave it to the wider fields of fancy. Send this pestilent, traitorous, cow-hearted, yeasty codpiece to the brink. They're doing something legitimately interesting with language in these movies, which is relying more on the rhythm of speech than its content. Can we in fact pretend that she is anything other than a woman scorned like which fury hell hath no? We cannot. Res ipsa loquita tabula nefragio. We are left with but one option. It's an appreciation for the beauty in language that exists outside the information being conveyed. And that's really awesome. Another thing, I love Governor Swan. Jonathan Price is really good casting. And this character could have been so stock patriarchy. I love that he's a good dad. There's a lot of warmth about him that adds a lot to his on-screen relationship with Elizabeth without relying on dialogue. Elizabeth, how's it coming? It's difficult to say. I'm told it's the latest fashion in London. It's sad when he dies. Rip Governor Swan. Last thing, it became abundantly clear to me during my marathon that Barbosa is a far superior pirate captain to Jack. He's a better leader, he's a better criminal, and he deserves the Black Pearl, I said what I said. Motherfucker captains the Pearl in a battle against the devil of the sea during a hurricane while officiating a wedding. Dearly beloved, we be gathered here today. Today, let yourself to the mask, you foxy car. And where is Jack during all this? Arguing with himself in jail. Go away. Jack and Barbosa's relationship is one of the few emphatically good things about the fourth and fifth movies. Back to that idea of rival gods. They're never friends exactly, but they have more in common with each other than almost anyone else. And that's basically just as good. Hector, this is me bestest mate in the whole world. I always knew you'd settle down eventually. Did you bring me a gift? <laughs> They'll do. They also bring that brethren court attitude along with them everywhere they go, by which I mean they're very petty and that's never not funny to me. He's the captain. I think it's funny when grown men act like children. So those are all the good things, good and bad, about each individual movie. 
But a franchise isn't just a series of individual movies, is it? They're supposed to come together as a whole. And the most basic problem with Pirates of the Caribbean is that most of the scenes are good, but somehow that doesn't translate into reliably good movies, with the exception of The Curse of the Black Pearl. So we have two questions left. What went wrong here? And is it salvageable? Okay, let's return to my issue with Beckett being able to control Davy Jones with the heart. Part of the fun and interest of these kinds of stories is the myth of it, right? Myth holds a kind of power that is untouchable by our sort of quotidian transactional human interests. That's why people romanticize pirates in the first place, even though they were all thieves and murderers. They represent something that daily life kind of lacks. In stories like the one they tell about Davy Jones, the heart is a metaphor, right? The story Tiadama tells is about a guy who gets so heartbroken that he refuses to feel anything ever again and basically succumbs to the dark side. But in Outworld Zen, it's just so literal. And you might say, oh, that's the point. It, like the immaterial has become immaterial. The East India Trading Company is filling in the blank spots on the map. It's a forward march of industry and it's killing all the wonder in the world. Nothing is unexplainable. Anymore. Whatever, yeah, yeah, whatever. I get it, I get it, I do. But figuratively, and this is the best way I can think of to explain what's happening here, Disney is kind of being the East India Trading Company with this plot device. The heart is only important in so much as it's a means to an end and it's meaningless otherwise. So everyone knows that the fourth and fifth movies are basically corporate ventures, right? But Dead Man's Chest and Outworld's End honestly feel almost as empty to me. Back in the day, the fuss about movies two and three was that they were bloated. There was too much plot. It was too long. It didn't make sense, etc. I don't think that's true. These are not difficult movies to understand. The problem is that they continually fail to be about anything more than having people we know on a screen doing stuff. At its core, this is a very high school English level problem. The Pirates of the Caribbean sequels have no theme. To illustrate, The Curse of the Black Pearl is a movie about greed. It has fairly complex thoughts about greed. Were you to map everybody in Curse of the Black Pearl on a greed spectrum, in the first act of the movie, you would have Will on one end and Barbosa on the other, and then Jack right in the middle. And then like, maybe Elizabeth is like over here, like a little bit between Will and Jack. Will is such a nice, nice boy that it pisses people off. Before Elizabeth is kidnapped, he is perfectly happy to give up any desires he has to start a thing with her and any credit he's due for his work just so he can continue to be a cog in the system. Elizabeth at least owns her desire for adventure. Will just has faith that if he participates in the system, the system will eventually deliver. What a dweeb. On the other hand, Barbosa is so greedy that it's not even fun for him anymore. That's basically what the curse is. It's a curse of perpetual greed. It makes you incapable of being happy with what you already have. Jack splits the difference in a way that everybody else is meant to emulate. He is selfish and he likes stuff, but he avoids hurting people if he can, and he has some kind of ethical direction. His is the fun kind of greed that it's implied everybody could stand to aspire toward. When he wants something, he figures out how to get it without resorting to brute force. It's a movie about the extent to which greed is a virtue and at what point it starts to make you into a bad person. There is no comparison in the sequels. They are about nothing. In fact, they're so aggressively about nothing that everybody's motivations gets completely scrambled or overlooked because giving people motivations would solidify a theme. There's a lot of talk online about what a great villain Davy Jones is, and I simply couldn't disagree more. Davy Jones looks amazing. Bill Nye portrays him amazingly. His on-screen characterization is amazing, but Davy Jones makes no sense. Again, on screen, his character is fine. Very scary, very menacing, I get it. He's an incel who's taking out his frustrations on the world, Blech. It's the logistics of Davy Jones that make no sense. Like what exactly is Davy Jones's deal? Did he agree to be Captain of the Flying Dutchman or is it a curse? Like it seems like the dead make it to the other side on their own, okay, so what do they need him for? And also, how is it he finds space in his head to hate Calypso so much when he's the one who imprisoned her in human form to begin with? Why'd he do that? And did she know it was him? The way Will tells her before she explodes into crabs makes it seem like maybe she doesn't, but Davy Jones himself is convinced that she won't hurt him. Like, see what I mean? These are basic character motivations. We need to know the exact circumstances of why he is who he is. His material conditions, if you like. He's constantly looking for people to serve aboard the Flying Dutchman, but isn't the thing supposed to be that he's been charged with ferrying the souls of the dead to the other side, and he's been refusing to do that? And that's why the tentacles? So what does he need souls for? If I were being generous, 
<clears throat> and allowing for a real stretch in headcanon, I guess you could say that his only remaining motivation is to prove to everybody he encounters that the world is a cruel and horrible place. It's the kind of philosophy that happens when you can't deal with things not going exactly your way all the time. It's an interesting idea, one that might have been nice to see explored if they had incorporated it into the plot, perhaps around some sort of theme. As another example, most of the plot of Dead Man's Chest hinges upon Jack's compass not working because Jack doesn't know what he wants. The compass points to whatever you want most in the world and it's just going completely haywire for him because he has no idea what he wants. It's the only justification for having Elizabeth there to do anything. This never comes back and is not resolved. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. That's a pretty basic motivational issue that should have been addressed. There's a line where Tia Dalma uh, is kind of making fun of him for not knowing what he wants and then says, or is it that you do know what you want and are loath to claim it as your own? Whatever it is that Jack wants that he doesn't want to claim as his own should be the theme of Dead Man's Chest. There's truly no reason to mention it otherwise. And whoopsie doodle, we forgot to answer that question or resolve it in any way. The heart of Davy Jones, to go back to that, has no function outside its logistical use to the plot. If we were rewriting this, with any kind of theme in mind, the heart would be like the source of some kind of moral struggle instead of just an item to fight over. Like, what if instead of just being stabbed, it's Davy Jones' specific lack of heart that itself leads to his downfall? Like, okay, what if Davy Jones has the heart on him? He's gotten it. There's no reason for him to stick around anymore. He can come Jack get Jack later on when he's hidden the heart again, so he just lets the Flying Dutchman fall into the maelstrom because he knows he's going to be fine. But Elizabeth is stuck on the ship and Jones has no faith in love. He doesn't have a heart anymore. So he thinks that that's that. Maybe he says something like over his shoulder to that effect. But then Will jumps over onto the Flying Dutchman purely to save Elizabeth. He and Jones duke it out and he gives uh, Elizabeth time to escape. And Jack also, I guess, Jack's there too. <laughs> Um, so he gives them time to escape, time to get out. Will gets a hold of the heart and stabs it as the Flying Dutchman is sinking. Specifically, he stabs it to save Elizabeth. I don't know. We'll workshop it. But the point is that the heart has to mean something. When Will stabs the heart, it's not even his decision. Jack does it for him. Oh shit, my light turned off. Oh well. And because Jack does it for him, it's barely even Jack's decision to not stab the heart. If we rewrote it that way around a moral struggle instead, it would coincide nicely with Jack's internal struggle. The nominal theme of Pirates of the Caribbean, by which I mean the thing that people tend to say when you ask them what these movies are about, is freedom. Bullshit. There is no such thing as freedom in the universe of these movies, not really. You can choose safety and oppression under British rule, or you can choose independence and constant mortal danger to yourself and others as a pirate. So basically, it's a choice between two different types of self-destruction, right? You can either be a pirate and ruin yourself physically, or you can be loyal to a bad system and ruin yourself spiritually, but you have to pick one. Every avenue that allows you to outrun this choice, the way to cheat death that Jack is constantly looking for over the entire series is inherently cursed because life without risk is as much a spiritual death as British rule is supposed to represent. These movies are at their most interesting when they acknowledge that. It's not just about living forever, Jackie. The trick is living with yourself forever. But I'm going to stop far short of saying that introducing those ideas just through dialogue is the same as actually engaging with them. Let's please have some higher standards than that. In other words, after the first movie, the series is pure lore. And I love lore. Give me a good list of facts and I will sit comfy for hours. But stories can't be just lore. This is a problem the MCU has too, but the MCU is like 25 movies long at this point. And every now and then the MCU actually is about something. It's about found families. It's about facing reality. It's about choosing to be a good person even though you have every excuse not to. Pirates of the Caribbean is a series of movies that desperately needs something to be about. So the big question amongst those of us who care about such things is whether Johnny Depp would ever come back as Jack Sparrow. He says he won't. And honestly, even without this lawsuit, I think he's getting a little old for the role. Among the many awkward things about the fourth and fifth movies is that the golden age of piracy was not very long. And they're already 
hinting at the encroaching end of that age with the third movie. Like, what are we supposed to think happens to the East India Company after Cutler Beckett dies? It just goes away, I suppose. That makes sense. Monopolistic corporations famously quit while they're ahead. These movies aren't episodic, you know? Like, they function on a specific timeline. You can pretty much map them all, more or less, onto a specific year, which means that by the time the fifth movie rolls around, we should historically be back where we started at the beginning of the third movie, with everybody crushed under the thumb of industry and piracy absolutely a thing of the past until 300 years later, uh, of course, the golden age of Napster and LimeWire. What do you as Disney do with a character like Jack Sparrow when it finally comes time to wrap this shit up because we're comfortably into the 1730s now and nothing stops the forward march of capitalism? Barbosa can have a hero's death, but we can't kill Jack Sparrow. He's a figure of myth. He's supposed to transcend the laws by which everyone else is governed. Killing him would wreck that. And more importantly, if we kill Jack Sparrow, how will we make more sequels? I do not think that there is a future for this iteration of Pirates of the Caribbean, but I don't buy the idea that there's no Pirates of the Caribbean without Johnny Depp. I think that's silly. I'm certain there will be a remake at some point and it might even be good if they can just let it rest for another 15 years or so to build up nostalgia. And that is probably the only way that we'll ever get any more Disney pirate stuff worth watching. If they remake it, they should probably just accept the idea that it won't see much success as a movie and just remake it as a Disney Plus series. Do prequels. Go back to before The Curse of the Black Pearl so that you have a good amount of time to do pirate shit before capitalism historically wipes it out. Retire Jack Sparrow, at least as the main character, even as a large supporting character. Give it a more even distribution of fun like it was in the first movie. If you must have Jack Sparrow, adapt some of the novelizations of Jack's youth. That might work. It's not like they don't have the rights to that stuff. You can even make it woke if you want. In fact, you probably should. I hear Disney recently floated the idea of a Pirates movie with an all-female cast. <laughs> that's no, that's not what I mean. That's the exact wrong kind of woke. As long as the other Pirates movies are coding pirates as a particular race and class, you might as well just make it about race and class. It's not inappropriate. Something like 30% of all pirates in real life were escaped slaves. The Black Pearl is canonically a slave ship and freeing slaves is canonically how Jack got the pirate brand. We had a deal, Jack. I contracted you to deliver cargo on my behalf. You chose to liberate it. People aren't cargo, mate. The Colonial Caribbean was super oppressive and violent, and piracy was, at that time, one of the only functional anarchist societies ever to exist. Like, pirates are inherently subversive. I don't know, I feel like they could put that to some culturally relevant PG-13 use. You can't say it's too dark. The other movies are plenty dark. To this day, I'm pretty sure Pirates is Disney's only PG-13 property, and that alone was kind of a risk for a company that up until that point had been very kid-friendly. I mean, I'm drinking rum right now in honor of a Disney movie. Like, that's a little weird, or at least it was weird in 2003. And that's the kind of weird that I very much appreciate. In my opinion, the reason people think that there can't possibly be any Pirates movies without Johnny Depp is because Johnny Depp saw the potential for what that kind of character could represent in terms of subverting norms and made it happen single-handedly, even though everybody around him was trying to get him to stop. Then I got phone calls like, please, what is he? What's going on? Is he, is he just like, you know, mentally like just gone? Has he just <laughs> left the building a long time ago? Is he, is he, is he just incredibly drunk or is he gay? You know. And so my answer was, I'm sorry, didn't you know that all my characters are gay? <laughs> um, that was the last question they asked. And, uh, you know, they were uncomfortable and I, and I put it to them that they were welcome to fire me, you know, and replace me if they wanted to. And because uh, I wasn't going to wasn't going to change what I built because I, I believed in it. You know, I believed in the character wholeheartedly. I, I, I felt that I was, I don't know, I felt very comfortable with him and I felt I was onto something. This franchise was already a success despite Disney, not because of them. So now that we don't have Johnny Depp to carry the entire movie on his back, the only thing to do is to take the same kind of risks with the property as he did with that character. But it's Disney, so they won't. <laughs>
Yeah, I just kind of feel like at this point, it's all just sort of ruined. <laughs> the Pirates movies went too hard, too fast, and now there's no coming back when some good-natured darkness might actually be in order for society. After the third movie, there's something about the series that really starts to feel dated. It's still a lot of fun. I had fun. But it really is starting to feel like it's from a different generation. Pirates of the Caribbean exists in that weird, awkward space between old Hollywood tentpole films and the world we live in now where everything is either Marvel or a TV show. That's why the Pirates movies feel so unbalanced. They're trying to stuff so much into a couple of hours that Marvel would do over an entire season of TV. I genuinely don't think that the problem is that superheroes found a way to be relevant in a way that pirates are not. The approach actually does matter here. I don't know, the more I think about it, the more I think that maybe a culturally relevant pirate movie might get a little too real. <laughs> I think they could pull it off, you know? Just stop relying on Johnny Depp to do it for you. Like, I think people underestimate how important The Curse of the Black Pearl is for establishing everything good about the sequels. I simply don't believe that if Dead Man's Chest was the first movie of this franchise that it would be anywhere near as successful. And that's a pretty big weakness if you're arguing that it's actually better than Curse of the Black Pearl. Big set pieces and fancy character design is a lot less important than fun. I don't know, Disney kind of irrevocably fumbled this one. And now we have a series that's only fun if you're able to avoid mourning what could have been. So I guess we're just back to the beginning on this. Maybe just watch them casually of a hot summer's day. Think about the sea and drink to forget. Yo-ho! Behold, I'm filthy, I'm and